Greetings, everyone. It's that time of the week again for Everything Went Black. I'm here with my brother, Ralph Schmidt. How's it going, Ralph? Doing okay, Mike. Thanks for having me back on again. It's good to be here and talk about like a topic that's really close to my heart. Yeah. Yeah, so today, Ralph and I are going to talk about who our favorite Dracula is and our favorite Dracula movies. There's been so much over the years. and But before we do that, we're going to talk a little bit about the new True Detective season, which uh, at this point, while we're recording it, only the first episode has been out. So we're just going to talk about our initial impressions of season four of True Detective. But uh, yeah. yeah, before we kick all that off, I just want to shout everyone out. Of course, I'm talking about my fellow horsemen of the podcasting apocalypse. Kicking the week off, we have Brandon Legion's Horror Wolf 666. His podcast is uh, dedicated to interviewing filmmakers, actors, anyone active in the horror community, as well as the occasional guest spot by his fellow horsemen. Tuesday, the greatest extreme music podcast on the internet. Of course, I'm talking about Into the Necrosphere, brought to you by Jackie Smit. I'm glad to see that he's returned from his uh, month-long holiday. That's a European style vacations, you know, and uh, I got to say, you know, I'm glad he's back to work. You know what I mean, Ralph? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's also the the one like music podcast that I actually listen to. And uh, I mean, I, I can't I can't stand like seeing Jackie like on the beach being like the surfer boy. You know, <laughs> I need his I need his grim menacing face uh, punishing the news and then telling everybody like what band is terrible. But like seeing him like in shorts on the beach with his like muscle tan. I don't know, man. Like Jackie, stay dark, man. Stay dark. <laughs> <laughs> Midweek, I come at you with Everything Went Black, which is uh, today's show that we're talking, me and Ralph are on. Thursday, I return on Necromaniacs alongside Mike Scandato and Jeff Kashid, and we discuss horror and horror-adjacent films. There's no um, interviews on that, so we don't want to step on uh, Brandon's toes. Friday, to round out the work week, we have Spitball Media featuring Mike Scandato's brother, John Draper. John Draper. Saturday is a day off, so go out. You know, go down to the Home Depot, buy yourself some flooring. You know, maybe, um, you know, do some chores around the house. Uh, spend time with your significant other, you know. Run her, up, run, run her up naked in the apartment, masturbate. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, whatever floats your boat, man. Yeah, you know. But on Sunday, be advised... That we return with Soul Knox, brought to you by Carl Hikara. And uh, that is an exploration into anything dark, macabre, esoteric. And uh, Carl and I have been doing a uh, collaborative series called Darkness Weaves, where we explore the work of Carl Edward Wagner, a criminally underrated horror, dark fantasy, and weird fiction author. And uh, so we were running through his entire catalog. So this is going to take us the next couple of years to finish. So tune in. Out there working on his own, like Colonel Kurtz in Apocalypse Now, we have Cheyenne bringing you Iblis Manifestations. You just have to pay attention and you'll, you'll get this excellent content from him on a monthly basis. Um, if anyone wants to support the show, by all means, share this with your friends. Follow us on social media. Um, Instagram, Facebook. You, I don't really interact too much on uh, social media except for maybe Instagram. But if you want to direct message me on Instagram, that's cool. I'll respond. Or if you want to join the Patreon for as little as $1 a month, you get to support the show. You get access to other content that we have that's Patreon exclusive. And uh, that is, there's a messaging system there. And um, I, we all stay in touch. It's like a really good little community we have. In 2024, we're going to schedule a couple of um, live hangout sessions, like where we will all get together on a, on a like a Zoom like meeting and just you know shoot the shit and uh, talk. We'll try, try to figure out a time frame that works for people because we have people all over the U.S. and in some Europeans in the in the mix there. So trying to pick a appropriate time is something that we're working on right now, and that's pretty much it, man. So um, so how's things going, Ralph? 
Um, I'm I'm living like like I told you before we started. Uh, I'm living on the on the ice planet of Hoth right now. <laughs> so uh, I need I need an ATAT to move around. We had like a gigantic snowstorm, which like uh, crushed Germany for uh, two days. Um, but um, on the other hand, it's like I'm I'm in a positive mood because um, uh, like first of all, I I mean. People know that I've been away for a while from podcasts and like social media. Try to like focus on my life, doing things better. And I think I made some good decisions. I'm feeling more comfortable. Um, the world is still like turning to shit, but um, there has been there has been like a, a crazy development where um, there was a meeting between like people from the AFD party. So this semi-right-wing open party and some full-on Nazis and it was like a secretive meeting and actual reporters like infiltrated it and brought out like the the infos like that they got and like these people were talking about remigration so they made plans how to uh, get every like a quote-unquote foreigner out of the country even if you have like a German pass and I mean, it's not something that I'm really like, oh, that's shocking news, but it's like it's gotten out and it's caused so much fury that like now every day there are demonstrations in Germany where like 30, 50 and yesterday in Hamburg, 160,000 people went out in the streets to say like we're standing opposed to fascism, racism. We don't want the AFD. We don't want Nazis in here. So, like, after all these years, like, with the pandemic and all this other shit where people go out in the street and say, like, oh, yeah, like, this is my opinion, and, and yeah, the foreigners, blah, 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 finally, like, a lot of people go out and say, fuck fascism, fuck Nazis, and we never want to have, like, a Third Reich again. So, that makes me happy, actually. Yeah, yeah man, that's, um, <laughs> there seems to be a rise globally in uh interest in fascism and authoritarianism you know we have uh yeah. germany you have hungary there's like uh you know developments in italy uh of yeah. course the you know the, the the old school china and ussr and of course here in the united states there's a huge authoritarian movement going on right now too and uh all i can say is that in 2024 things are heating up <laughs> Yeah. I mean, hasn't, hasn't Trump said like he wants to be like a dictator now? Like when he comes back, Straight he up. wants to have the, the death penalty back and stated everywhere. And yeah, it's it's crazy, man. I mean, I like the election is like pest and like choosing between pest and cholera, I think. Like, yeah, I mean, it's not even a matter of uh, being conservative anymore. It's like you're like a straight up fascist or you believe in like democracy, you know? And yeah. I don't know. That dude's been like poisoning the minds of like people in this country, and it's it's very alarming, you know. Yeah. I wish someone oh, would man. kill him or something. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, like I, I'm I'm always you know like uh, I'm a human rights uh, supporter, so of course like uh, the death penalty is never a thing that I would consider. But like, I mean, Trump, this dude, like I. I wish so bad that he would actually like see the inside of a jail, but then like a jail that would actually be like a jail, not like the luxurious palace he'd probably go to when he when he would go to jail. Yeah, I, I just wish someone would assassinate him, to be honest, and be rid yeah. of that that plague. You know. Yeah, I mean the thing is, you know, like uh, there will be like he would be a martyr then, and then people would like there would be people following up on him. I don't know. Like it's always hard to say. Like how can you get rid of this stupidity? And yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe someone will run him over with a truck. Maybe one of his own guys. You know, like he wants to, like to storm the capital with a with a pickup truck or an SUV, and by chance like hits him. I don't know. Like <laughs> maybe he'll just die. Like of natural causes like that dude doesn't seem to be living the most uh, healthy lifestyle to be honest mm. too too much uh self tan and uh too much too much bleach on the hair i don't know dude yeah. i was watching this footage of him and he's straight up wearing lipstick too <laughs> no i mean if you yeah. look at, he has like flesh tone lips which is like it looks like he's he, mm. he definitely wears makeup and i'm like he looks like a, an aging like la glam rocker with the with the flesh yeah. tone, you know. That's right. Like he could be a Motley crew. 
<laughs> anyway, so yeah, uh, enough, um, you know, bat bashing of Donald Trump. Let's move on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So true detective. What did you think? Interesting. Interesting. I can't, as you know, from the, uh, you know, we had our thread amongst all the different guys and the horsemen and, uh, Generally, I feel positive about it, but I'm not completely sold just yet. Hmm. You know, it's, yeah, you um, said you have, you have a problem with the female cop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, here we go. All right, I got to watch what I say now. All right. Yeah. Um. All right. I I like Issa Lopez. She wrote the first episode and is directing the uh, the season. All right. I'm, I think she's a good, she's solid. All right. Uh, mm. Nick Pizzolatto is not involved. Which I, I'm a fan of his writing. I have um, I've read Galveston, his novel. I have his collection of short stories, which I've quite enjoyed. Um, the first season of True Detective was brilliant, and everyone knows how much we love it because we did a devoted mm-hmm. a whole episode to it. But his track record for the for season two and three, and I know I know there are probably a number of factors that contribute to the somewhat lukewarm. Uh, you know, reception of those two. Um, so maybe it's not such a bad idea that he's not hands on in this new thing mm-hmm. that's going on. Okay. Now, very promising. Uh, it's got a cool atmosphere. Uh, it's in general, it's really well written. Uh, I think, uh, Jodie Foster as, uh, Liz is great. I'm always, always backed her as an actress. I think she's great. Uh, Navarro by, uh, the, uh, who was being portrayed by uh, Kali Reese to have he- very heavy handed, very heavy handed. And mm. it's just like that, that whole trope is tired. I think, you know, we've kind of been mm. through it all. Okay, you know, the tough, badass, like woman. I mean, great. I don't, I, I have no problem with that. That's awesome. But in like a setting like this with the face piercings, it's like you're a cop. It's like, I, I don't know, man, like it's too heavy handed, too much for me, really. Yeah, and it, I'm, I mean, it seems to be like the trope that they're going for, that it's always been like that there's always a team of cops that don't like each other at first, you know? And I yeah. mean, we all know that eventually they will grow together and fight for one another. Um, that was that what I thought, like, okay, yeah, I don't know, like, if we should do it that way. But um, first first impression was, that CGI sucks. Yeah. Like with with the with the reindeer, yep. and that looked terrible. And I'm like, oh no, here we go. Um, and then I was like, of course, like the first scene you see is like them jumping off a cliff. I'm like, no, I don't want to like see a show where like animals die like in the first scene. That's like terrible. But then I'm like, okay, let's let's keep on going. And I have to say, I watched the episode twice now, and I really really enjoy it. Um. I mean, in the in the beginning credits, you see that like uh, that. Um, oh damn, man! Like Hill, Pizzolatto Hill is. In, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, like like Lena, like the the three OGs. So Pizzolatto, McConaughey, and um, uh, Wood uh, Harrison. Yeah. That they're all executive producers, so they've got a hand in it, and and I think there's like you can see there's a quality control to it, you know, like the the which which I really like and I enjoy. And um, I had a, like I had fun watching it, and I had to like enjoy it going back watching it a second time because a lot of small uh, like bows to the big ones. I mean, it's the setting that there's there's a feeling of like okay, so there's a bit of like David Lynch in there. It's mm-hmm. a bit of like a bit of Fargo in there. The setting, you know, like it has a bit of Thirty Days of Night. It looks contemporary without looking too shitty because. I have to say, after the the, the shitty uh, reindeers, it actually looked pretty solid. I like the setting, like the 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 thing setting, and then they have the the thing DVD, like pretty much right in the picture. There's a lot of it that I liked, and I'm really curious where the story will go. I th- it feels more like a horror thing, you know, like yeah. more like the beginning of a horror movie than all the other seasons. And I'm 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 curious. I'm really curious. I mean, I, I would love for it to go more in the horror direction, but what I would love even more, and I'm going to mention this now, and maybe, you know what, maybe at the end of this, we wrap, we do, we do another episode on this to talk, talk yes. it through. But, uh, yeah. all right, it, it starts off with, um, 
it's and it's actually not a quote from uh, from the chamber's uh, repairer of reputations, but it's a quote developed for the series that is attributed to Hildred Castain from Repairer of Reputations, mm -hmm. Robert Chambers. And that story is part, part of the uh, King in Yellow. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there's that. But but it's not actually in, in the text of the short story. Now, what's interesting about Hildred Castain is that he is an unreliable narrator in the, sto the short story. I found that very interesting about mm -hmm. why put this element into the storyline and then we we get ourselves into the first season the first uh, episode rather and uh there's all these factors going on you know there's uh salal that institute that's um trying to look at the origins of life on earth which i'm already fascinated <laughs> like already you got me there okay great there's mm -hmm. like uh, isolated scientists okay great that's like the thing awesome it's the last day the last sunset of the year and it's going to be what 60 days of darkness Okay, I love it. Mm. Totally in. Isolated northern region of, of the world. Totally down. Um, there's these apparitions that start showing up. There's uh, contaminated water. There's a mine. There's this subplot of the murder. There are all these elements that are adding to the story. Now, the unreliable narrator, this perceived supernatural element in the movie could it actually be supernatural or it could could it be attributed to madness or an unreliable narrator that's the mm. thing that's got me intrigued about this mm -hmm. and like that that's like a kind of like a high concept and then they have this kind of lowbrow like character like navarro in the in the mix is just to me like a little a little too uh there's a little disharmony there for me like a little discord and uh yeah, you know, I have nothing against women. I love women. I love tough women. You know, there's like, I train, you know, martial arts with lots of women who are awesome and can beat me up probably, and that's great. But the discord between this kind of really cool brooding weird fiction element and then, I don't know, just to me, that's the one knock I have on the first episode. Now, that might change over the um, mm. course of the season, but that, that, that's, my, that's the one thing that kind of brought me out of the story a little bit. Yeah, I, I I agree to like this point where because I think I think the I mean everything you just mentioned is the same stuff that resonates with me. Uh, oh wonder, like you know. But um, I when when I think back on that episode, I don't think about the character arcs of the both of both the protagonists right now. Right. You know, there's like yeah, like she's she's a she's a single mom police officer, and her daughter is doing like stupid stunts, and you know, then and and the other one is like that badass cop. But like, do I really like? I don't really remember like all the backstory that I was like ha got because I've seen it twice. But the rest of the story is so appealing that I can like look over it. I mean, it will be like an important point when the show goes on because I don't think they would do a show where like the ca characters are just like randos, you know, like it's, yeah, here she, she's a single mom and she's a badass cop. But like, I mean, there's this interpersonal dimension always, and it will have an effect on the story. I'm pretty positive, but um, yeah, so this doesn't bother me too much at the moment. And I know people have been hating on this and I mean, it's like with everything now, like something happens in the media and you have people praising it to the highest and you have people like running into the ground and I'm more on the positive side. I'm not sold yet, but I'm intrigued. I mean, I don't hate it. Definitely. And I, I think out of the, out of the, besides from season one, it's definitely the more interesting one that I've seen, yeah. you know, and, uh, <coughs> and like, you know, the, it, it, there's a lot there. And also I forgot to mention the element of the return of the spiral, which yes. hark harkens back to, uh, you know, season one and that mm. cult of rich people, uh, that are, you know, involved in all this, like, uh, you know, abuse and ritualistic, uh, sexual, sexual stuff. And maybe that's part of it. Maybe like, I I'm interested to see where that goes. You know, it, maybe it's, it's a red herring. Who knows? You know. Yeah, I think uh, what they what they're doing with this one is like a hail mary. I think they they like they try to establish something where it's like, okay, here's the name, but every season can be something completely different. 
and this didn't work. Like the idea of what Halloween was supposed to be. Yeah. You know, like, and they did it like, oh no, it's like Michael Myers was so successful. So we'll bring him back for a part two, but now we're done. Let's do something great with three. I love the third Halloween, but no one takes it as an actual Halloween movie, even if it's kind of set in the same universe, you know? And the second and third season of True Detective, if they had a different name, I probably enjoyed the shows more. But I expected something, everybody expected to this like occult stuff coming back. I didn't expect it, but I like, I hoped that it would be like more in a horror kind of realm or like darker. Yeah. And season two and three, there were just like criminal cases. And it's cool. I liked it. But this one has like all the intrigue for the people that came in the first season and said, like, I want to have like more of a horror element, maybe like the idea of something supernatural. Um, you have to spiral. So I think that they will do this as a because they want to, but also as like we have to get the OG fans back and see where it lands. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I actually really liked season two um, for different reasons, obviously. And one of the things I'm hoping for is uh is they actually embrace the idea of the king in yellow you know which is not necessarily a person you know um but yeah an idea that drives people insane and to do horrible things you know and like in our two-part seats you know two-part series we did on it we kind of go into a little bit of the philosophy of that you know and uh which is uh you know anyone out there we did who hasn't listened to it yet we did a regular stream uh, episode on the first season and then we did a a deep dive philosophical episode on patreon for uh, season one and we talk about some of the things like the actual king in yellow being um, a motivator you know this uh, sort of tulpa out there in the in the void that motivates people to do terrible things and that's kind of the vibe i'm getting for this i mean this is all once again projection so i'd like to Re regroup at the end of this and then reflect back on the things I'm about to say and see if it, this is actually true. That season one and season four are connected, but not directly. Like, it's not like going to be like the Childress family has anything to do with what the no. events in season four. But that spiral maybe is connected to some overarching concept that is connected to this, the king in yellow and it, it, once it gets in the mind of someone, it, it creates this, um, this like, uh, you know, insanity that drives them to do these terrible things. So that's kind of my prediction as to where season four is going to go. Dude, wh one word, Lovecraft. Mm -hmm. the, story, the stories are in the same universe. They're not directly connected. They reflect to the, they, they, they refer to the same like kind of lore, you know, yeah. like there's always the mention of the, of the Necronomicon and, and the mad Arab, Albert Al-Hazred, but like some of like rats in the wall doesn't happen in the same street as Dagon, you yeah, know, like exactly. it's so, and I, I think, and this is like kind of what I'm hoping for. And I would love to have like a Lovecraftian kind of, a story arc to it like i mean no, not story arc like i don't want to have like a cthulhu show up or something <laughs> but but um i mean having these stories placed in the same like it's the same universe it's like different weird different weird things happening at the same time or like the thing that uh stephen king did i mean yeah. he did the same thing you know and i would love that yeah and and they have to bring back castle rock by the way that was a good show yeah i could see that um I back that idea. Like, it'd be cool if this is like the hook for season five and six and seven, and it's all this different connections to that spiral and, you know, the king in yellow and that idea, you know. So let's see what yeah. happens. I mean, they definitely, yes. I, I, I'm going to guarantee you that someone mentions Carcosa and the king in yellow because why why have that quote or that yeah. alleged quote in the beginning from Hildred Castain, you know? Yeah. I'm I'm really excited if they will if they will like do an um like breaking the fourth wall and and making a reference to like when I mean like the end scene of the first episode was finding like the the lost scientists like frozen in shock like in the middle of the ice mm -hmm. if someone will say like oh man this looks like the thing you know because <laughs> That would be funny. Like, I, I like this. Like, it's not, like, meant in a funny way, but it, it would be cool to have, like, these nods to, to the OGs. And, 
yeah, I'm I'm intrigued, and I mean, it's ten episodes, so it starts January, January, so it's February, March, April, some sometime around April, it should be done. And yeah, then then we'll do an episode on it. Definitely, you know. Yeah, so I, off to a good start. You know, like I said, I yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I might have come across too negative in our thread, but um, I, I don't feel I watched it again last night actually, and uh, you know, my my girlfriend Tina loves it. She thinks it's great, you know, and she's a huge yeah. fan of uh, True Detective and you know that sort of stuff. Yeah, Mike, we're still not used to having positive Mike in our thread. You know, <laughs> like it's. Uh... <laughs> It's 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 taking some time to get used to to like cheery jolly old Mike Hill, you know, like it's 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 not not it's not a thing we know in this threat. <laughs> right on, man. So uh, yeah, tomorrow tomorrow's we're recording this on a Saturday, and tomorrow the new episode drops. So I'm looking forward to checking it yep. out. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's move on, man. Uh, all right. So Dracula, you know. No, first of all. You've read the novel, right? The Bram Stoker novel. I I will answer this with a like a complete different quote, but um, <laughs> my my thesis, Dracula is the the greatest book ever written. Here, here you have it. Okay. Um, so I, I asked you that question not because I didn't know the answer, but because I wanted to establish yeah. a data point yeah, for yeah. people listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> Dracula is hands down my favorite fictional like kind of horror creature like or like novel like uh, like uh, what do you call it like an uh, book book character I don't know like fictional character yeah okay I I think vampires are fantastic like great in in stories and uh, yeah I mean Dracula is like the OG book and uh, yeah I think. To me, my favorite book of all time might be Dracula. Yeah, I as far as like uh, creatures go, I'm definitely more of a werewolf guy. But there has been yeah. no equal to Dracula in the literary world that features a werewolf. Yes, you know, there's no right. definitive text for werewolves. You have to go back to folklore and uh, yeah. up the plethora of movies and you know things. It's more of like a a media thing. The werewolf, you know. Yeah. So well, this is like a, this again brings us like full circle to I mean we've been talking about it for we've known each other forever we've done so many things like in podcasts and interviews and then back when we did that interview for Cult Nation where you and I interviewed each other yeah and and I made this comparison American depression versus European depression where I said you're Henry Rollins and and uh, I'm um, Ian Curtis, you know, like yeah. the British more settle and like uh, the tense, like intense, hard guy. And this is the same thing with Dracula and where like vampires and werewolves, you know, yeah. vampires are emo and, and, and ver werewolves are war metal, you know, like it's it's kind of like the narrative. And like I, we, we talked about like the vampire and werewolf thing. But yeah, to me, vampires are the greatest. I love I love werewolves but like you said there is no not like that one werewolf character that everybody knows yeah about. with that said dracula it rates very high on uh on yep. characters that i enjoy and the lore of vampires is interesting to me and you know the different iterations of like some of the eastern european ideas that connect vampires to like you know lucifer and fallen angels and things like that that stuff is really really interesting to me but um yeah. big fan of the novel um it's a little cumbersome if you haven't read it out there. So it's like if you're, if you listen to this and you're motivated to read Bram Stoker's Dracula, uh, be advised that it's the book can be a slog. Like it has very interesting parts, and then there's like long sections that are kind of that trudge along in some ways. Yeah. yeah. Would Would you agree with that? Yeah, it is. It is. It's not like I mean, it, it took me like two or three beginnings to read it, and. Um, but then it's like once you're, and it's kind of like reading Frankenstein with like with a you know with a with a letter style. Yeah. I prefer like a straight up like story. But like once you, it's like this, or when I when I in school I had to read Faust, like Goethe's Faust, yeah. and in the beginning I'm like, what the fuck? Like this is all rhymes, <laughs> and it's like I don't get it. Um, and then it's like once you get used to it, it's just so much more intense, or like the Divine Comedy or books like that. And yeah, Dracula 
is a very complicated and complex novel. And I think that that's why um, there's never been one like filmed installment of Dracula that um, that kn knocks like all the scapes of the book in terms of terror, sexuality and adventure out in, in one go. You have like different installments with different features, but there's not the definite Dracula, the book as a film, I think. Yeah, I agree with you on that for sure. Now that comes up to um, our next point, you know, as you mentioned just now that there's been like a plethora of uh, film attempts to capture the essence of Dracula. And um, did you know, okay, oh, go ahead. What were you going to say, Ralph? Did you did you know that it's like that Dracula owns the Guinness World Record for the most uh, um, the most products like in his name? There's uh, <laughs> like the last end was 538 productions that feature the character of Dracula, and that's record setting because no other literary character has ever been in more films or shows. I, I believe that. I definitely believe that. I mean, all the way from, uh, you know, Laurel and Hardy, you know, <laughs> to, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, the more, the British, uh, see, you know, see the, you, the, um, you know, that British, uh, series that came out a few years ago. It's like almost every year there's some kind of Dracula thing, you know? Yeah. So with that said, who is your favorite Dracula? Like what film, what actor portrays Dracula in the best to your liking? Like who, who's your definitive Dracula? Um, I mean, I, I guess you know it. Um, a lot of people out there know it, and it's uh, my 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 countryman Klaus Kinski um, in Nosferatu, Phantom der Nacht, nineteen seventy nine, the year of my birth, Werner Herzog film, Isabella Gianni, one of the most beautiful oh, yeah. women and most talented actresses. With the soundtrack of Popo Vu, um, this, it's the most goth version, I think, of Dracula. And I just think that like Kinski's playing the, the quotes, the absence of love is the most abject pain. Everything is so gloomy and goth. And his slow pacing creature that he plays, to me, is the perfect Dracula. It's my favorite one. Well, I, I knew the answer to that question for sure. Yeah, yeah. but uh, I, I also uh, he's not my my favorite, but I back that decision to go with him. And uh, one of the other things I really dug about uh, Nosferatu is when Harker goes to the castle. Right, the yeah. castle looks like it's in complete ruin. Yes, you know it's not like this uh, elegant place. You know, uh, it has this like it looks like it doesn't even have heat. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it looks like the boiler. Every... The boiler is in disrepair, and com there's no coal. Or there's nothing, and like the place just looks like a. You know, just from the actually from the few scenes that you see inside, my imagination develops an entire picture of what this castle looks like, including the heating plant that may be in the basement that's not doesn't yeah. hasn't had coal in the Stoker for like yeah. decades. You know. Yeah, and that that's the whole movie looks just frozen. Everything in there looks cold and bleak and dreadful. Also, like when the Demeter then crosses the, the ocean to go to London, when they reach London, everything just looks cold and sad. And and I don't know, like that to me is like it's perfect. It's way, way more gloomy. It's more and more gloomy than the book is. And like when I read the book, I I mean the Borgo Pass when they cross the path, it's freezing, kind of like outside right now. But um, there's like these beautiful scenic descriptions, and uh, Herzog's version is just cold, like all like what you just said. You see it, like you see the first scenes, and you know what you're into. Yeah. Well, that first scene wasn't that shot in the catacombs. Yes, that opening yes, yes, scene yes. for like no reason yeah. at all, just to add this like element of. Uh, darkness to the movie an additional darkness yeah. element you know yeah um yeah man it's uh i mean i when when planks did uh we'd always did like these these movie shirts where we had like limited runs or like with show characters we had like a a tall man phantasm shirt 
we had a, like a Ben of Lost. Like I totally forgot this that Lost was a thing back then. And oh we yeah, had, like a character Ben shirt, and we we already had like a, a, a Dracula, like a Kinski Dracula. This classic picture where he's like uh, above the bed of of a Johnny. Um, and um, we had this as a shirt printed, and that's when the biography of Kinski's daughter came out, and it said that like Kinski, uh, well, touched her in a, in a ways he shouldn't touch her, <laughs> and, we're, and we're like, oh Jesus, like now we just say, okay, let's throw away these fifty shirts, like I don't want to sell them. Um, yeah, still like still my favorite Dracula. Yeah, yeah, Kinski uh, definitely a problematic guy. It seems, you know. I mean, dude, like if you look at look at his like look at his movies, look at his acting. I mean, there's it's it's too bad that there's no subtitles. Otherwise, I would already I would have already given like I gotten you a DVD. There's two DVDs that came out some years ago, which just features um, Kinski going off on other people. Oh, man. it's like this. Yeah, it's it's like there's a talk show, like a German talk show, which looks so fucking German in the 60s. Where there's like three leather lawn chairs on like a, on a round stage and people around them, everybody in the audience is smoking all the time. It's pretty <laughs> much just dudes and like some women, and it's like the host is sitting in the middle. You've got Manfred Krug, which was like a, a famous actor, but like he was never really big, and he's like the first pe- person on stage, and then they get out Kinski. And like the, the 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 guy that hosting the show, it took it took him like two stupid questions to get Kinski to the point of breaking, and then it's just like a thirty five minute monologue of him like getting like annihilating this guy. And Manfred Cook, the other one, is just leaning back, smiling, and just enjoying the shit show. And it's just stuff like this, or like at the set of of Aguirre, where he threatens to get like all the indigenous people to go out and kill Werner Herzog on <laughs> like, it's it's dude it's this guy was so insane but you have to be insane like this to play like he did and i think that's that's the the calm insanity of this figure in this in this movie is what intrigues me the most about his version of dracula yeah it's a very german uh version <laughs> of of dracula yeah, for yeah, sure yeah. you know yeah um yeah, I mean, you got you got Klaus Kinski, you got uh, Werner Herzog, and you got Bruno Gantz in the film too. Yes, you know, yeah, man, powerhouses. And then you got the the lovely um, Isabella Gianni in that film, French lady. You know, dude, have you, dude? You should like after we after we hang up, Google Isabella Gianni twenty twenty three. I don't want to. She, <laughs> she. No, you want to because she's still unbelievably oh. beautiful. Okay, dude, like she, she's legit, a, still a beautiful woman. Like I was, I was thinking, like, oh man, let's see, like what time did to? Oh no, like she's stunning. Yeah, what? A, and like the, I mean, I have to say, like, dude, Nosferatu is one of my favorite movies, and Possession is one of my favorite movies, and she owns both these movies. Yeah. No, definitely, yeah. So that I, I, I will. I was afraid because, um, you know, I. I a huge admirer of hers and uh yeah i was afraid to see how maybe time had not been so kind to her you know yeah um before you go like into yours let me guess what yours is okay go ahead leslie nielsen and dracula (laughs) dead and loving it (laughs) ah you got me man ah yeah i I know i know you no i know you so well (laughs) No, oh, no look, I have I, I have a feeling, but like, yeah. Oh, real, real quick about Germans. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, this can take a while. I I got into a a wor- a sort of like a wormhole with um you you one of your one of the bands you turned me on to ascetic ascetic. Uh wait the the post punk band ascetic ascetic yeah no yeah ascetic yeah. the band but they, they, they were yeah, one of your yeah. they were one of your staff picks uh, like last year right yeah. yeah they have that track pharmacy. Yeah. Yeah. So I was watching on YouTube a bunch of, uh, you know, videos of them and, um, Mm. you know, they put me in this other wormhole of other bands and stuff. And I'm just thinking to myself, I'm like in, in the kind of like odyssey of exploration, I was like, man, you know, if I wasn't born in the U S I think I'd like to be German. (laughs) (laughs) 
I don't know. Sure. Cool yeah. music. It's everyone looks cool in Germany. You know, it's a good. It's a, I like. I miss going there. I miss there. I'll be there at the end of the year. Me and Tina will be there. Yes, that that will be stellar. Yeah, I mm-hmm. I still yeah. I hope like I hope like no, to, no. the cat the cats. It, yeah, it'll happen. We've already started making plans to do that. Uh, she will accompany yeah. me. We will spend a week in Germany and um, not just visiting you. We're going to be going to other places too. So yeah, that so cool yeah that's that's awesome but um to to like before you know before x goes nuts on our asses and like cancels us uh ascetic are actually australian and they just they just moved to berlin and they've been living in berlin for a while now so they they look real german and they wear on the german label but they're actually australian i had no idea Wow, that's why you never. That's because you never listen carefully to what I'm saying in my episodes. You know, I, I do, but I, I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm advancing years, man. You know, my my brain's not what it used to be. You know, no, it's all good, man. But like, yeah, I, I get what you, I get what you mean, and especially like, you know, like the love we, like we both share for German post punk culture in Berlin in the late '80s, uh, in the early '80s, with like, I mean, uh, the. Um, I always forgot uh, Wings of Destiny is the English oh, name. Yeah. 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 With the performances of Crime and the City Solution and Nick Cave. It's this is like peak German coolness back then. Yeah. Do you think that uh, when the birthday party relocated to Berlin, that might have had something to do to motivate Ascetic to uh, to move into Berlin? Absolutely. That, it, it absolutely. Ha- it is still to this day, people from all over the, I'm look at Espen and the witch. They came from the UK. They moved to Berlin. It's like a lot of bands that I could name that moved there. I mean, yeah. Like Louis Vasquez, the guy of soft moon who like tragically passed. Yeah. He, he moved from America to Berlin because Berlin is still like a very flourishing, like music scene. And it has like this weird thing to it, which I never like got into. So I have a lot of people in Berlin that I really, really like, good friends. But the city Berlin and I, we never became good friends. I mean, I, I, run, I ran around there with a stash singing into a camera, you know, and I did that for you. <laughs> uh, um, but like Berlin and I, nah, not, not my thing. But like when it comes to music, there's no fucking around with Berlin, you know. And yeah, especially back then. Yeah, a lot of people... Uh became like a thing to move there from the states uh you know the swans are have relocated there um yeah you know and uh dana who you know plays in the swans she lives there now she moved from brooklyn and yeah there's just like a bunch of people um a former member of tombs lives in uh in berlin mm-hmm. now who has a dual yeah. citizenship by the way okay yeah so he will, yeah, that's it by, by the way, like when I, when I spoke about remigration, like the stupid Nazi plan, that's their cool concept now to uh, il- il- allow the double citizenship. And when they have this, they want to change the law so you, they can kick you out to the other citizenship place you have. Like that's their new cool strategy. Wow. Well, the dude yeah. that has the double citizenship that I'm referring to is actually like he was born in Germany, though. Oh, OK. So he's okay. a German national. <laughs> okay let, let me let, be careful with what i'm saying oh, the memory of the the memory of this mem, uh, this memory uh wait the memory of this band member is already fading <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah yeah all right so, so we're, we're, we're up to me now all right um, yeah you're what's okay. your dracula my favorite dracula is uh christopher lee man from the hammer films Okay, I thought Bela Lugosi, but okay. I mean, I want I want Bela Lugosi to be my my favorite, but just because he is great, you know, and he was the OG, yeah. you know. But I got to be honest with you, man. I had to. I wrote down Bela Lugosi originally, but I was thinking, you know what, man, that's false. The guy that I really mm. really enjoy as Dracula is Christopher Lee, and it's because mm. when I was a little kid, they had. Uh, all the Hammer films would play on Saturday afternoons, right? So I, I watched all, and there's a lot. There's a lot of Hammer horror films, you know. And all the, they made Hammer. They they from 1958 to 1972, they basically made, or 1973, they made uh, Hammer Hammer horror films featuring um, Dracula. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. The final one, the Satanic Rites of Dracula, it's got, um, I'm sorry, Legend of the Seven. Well, I'm just fucking this up. Satanic Rites has, that's the last uh, Lee and Peter Cushing um, mm-hmm. Dracula. I mean, Cushing wasn't in, Van Helsing in some form wasn't in all of them. But that was the final appearance of Christopher Lee as Dracula. And then The Legend of the Seven Gold Vampires came out in, uh, I think, 73 or 74. And that has a different guy as Dracula. Mm. But it features Cushing in it, too. Kind of weird. But, uh, yeah, he... The the 1958 Dracula does not follow the Bram Stoker story at all. You know what yeah. I mean? It just kind of it uses some of the characters, like Jonathan Harker's in it. Jonathan Harker becomes a vampire, you know, uh, originally he, I mean, Harker was like a vampire hunter in the original one. Um, but he has, Dracula has like its own universe. It's like almost like this, uh, the Marvel comics version of Count Dracula, you know? Yeah. And I mean, there was a Dracula in the Marvel universe. (laughs) Oh, that was great. That was incredible. Actually. I love those. There's, uh, yeah, I mean the the color comics version of Dracula was okay, but there was the Tomb of Dracula, which I think had like sixty issues maybe, and it told mm-hmm. a story from issue one with an ending at issue whatever sixty, and I'm a huge huge fan of that comic book for sure. <coughs> yeah, it's it's fantastic. Yeah, I all I always loved that. I still ha- don't own it. But um, yeah, I need to like track down like a compendium. I mean, there's a, probably compendiums that have all the books contained. Yeah, there's a couple of them actually. There's I have um, one of them's in black and white, and then the other one's in color. And I think Mike has the uh, color color version, Scandato. That is. Mm. But uh, Christopher Lee, yeah. like, there's that iconic. It's the scene that really hooked me as being my favorite Dracula is in is in the 1958 version where there's a shot of him with bearing his fangs with the blood. And it's a very iconic shot. And I think they made a bunch of posters out of it and all that. And I was like, damn, that's scary. Yeah. I I think like my favorite like look of him was, oh man, like which, which part was that? Uh, let me see my list. Uh, which is the one where he has like a mustache. Like there's there's one uh, Christopher Lee Dracula where he, where he rocks a mustache, and I always thought that, that that looks like fucking cool, but it's not my favorite uh not my favorite Christopher Lee Dracula. Well, you know, you ha- Dracula in yeah. Stoker's novel had a mustache. Yeah, that's that's why <laughs> that's why I think it's like suitable, but like Christopher Lee also just looks fucking cool wearing it. Yeah. I play around with growing a mustache every now and then. You should, man. You're a Guido, so do it. I was given uh, explicit um, instructions from the the woman Oops. in my life that if I did <laughs> follow through with that, um, I would be uh, I wouldn't be allowed certain uh, certain things. So okay. So that that's what's uh, staying my hand on pulling the trigger on growing a mustache full on. Uh, see, positive positive Mike is already under the boots. Everything changes, man. <laughs> I might, I might do like a real sketchy one for the upcoming tour. You know, so we'll <laughs> like a like a Dali one, like yeah. with like really thin outsides, yeah. Or like one of those like sketchy like fourteen year old kid mustaches, you know, like where you're <laughs> like because I won't have enough time to really embrace embrace it, so it won't be full. Yeah, but it'll be this like twitchy like little kid mustache you know they're like these kind of mustaches smile at me every day by the dozen <laughs> <laughs> yeah bet man um which which of do you have like one like hammer horror christopher lee dracula you like the best like yeah. is there one? Oh yeah yeah I, I mean for sure it's the 1958 um Dra- you know dracula straight up because that's where that has mm-hmm. that iconic scene in it yeah. And I wouldn't. I would say an interesting rendition of it is Dracula A.D. 1972. Okay. Yeah. Um, that one is like a a very. Uh, it's like Dracula in the 70s. Okay, and Peter Cushing is in it, but he plays like a descendant of uh, of uh, the original Van Helsing. Okay. Mm. And Dracula is like you know, once again resurrected, <laughs> just like in all the other uh, you know sequels. 
but it, it has like this uh, 1970s kind of hippie vibe to it. There's like a, actually Mike and I did a, um, an episode on it over at Necromaniacs. Mm. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, also, Dracula Prince of Darkness is good. It takes place um, 10 years after uh, the original 1958 Dracula, you know, which is you know, the first film. There's no Van Helsing in it, though. So uh, mm. that's another good one. Um, Dracula has risen from the grave, uh, 1968. Uh, once That's, again, yeah. Dracula is, uh, accidentally resurrected. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's just cool. It's, um, you know, it, it just, it's, that's a good one. I would rec any of those are good, but those ones, if you want to go through yeah. the, the, the comic book hero, like the, the superhero of the anti-hero, the super anti-hero, uh, Dracula as portrayed by Hammer. Those films are definitely ones, but definitely start with the 58 version. Yeah. Yeah. I should like pretty much like a good bet is to go chronologically. Um, my favorite of those is Dracula has risen from the grave mm -hmm. just because the, the side characters are pr like they're written better, I think in comparison to the rest. And um, you don't see Christopher Lee that often. That's what makes his appearance that more impactful. You know, like the other ones are really focused on him being the centerpiece. The other one is like pretty much the story of the actors, uh, Carson and Andrews. And I think that that he is like, his, this is the subversive of like behind the scenes and then appears and then the terror starts. I, I, I always like, like thinking about it, it's like that the, the director has risen from the grave from 68 is probably my favorite Christopher Lee one. Yeah, and that's actually more consistent with the vibe of the... Um of the first, uh, of the book really, you know, it's like he is, um, more behind the scenes in the novel, you know? Yeah. It's, um, yeah. I mean, there's a plethora of, of versions and, and I think, I don't know, like, is there anyone that played Dracula more often than Christopher Lee did? I don't think so. Right. The like he's probably the one with the most entries asked Dracula. Yeah. I mean, and that's why I think for me, when I, when I was growing up, I thought of Christopher Lee as Dracula, you know? Yeah. I see. But I mean, Bela Lugosi is the, uh, the poster boy, I think in a way for the goth scene, because it was like really early after like the silent one, which is cool, but it's more like an art movie to me now, like the 1922, right. uh, Dracula. Um, so like the, the the 1931 Ted Browning Dracula with Lugosi is like the first proper movie and it has like all the goth traits to it and I think like Christopher Lee brought him like to the map as an actual actor and ever since then there has been like good takes on it terrible takes on it um but yeah I mean he's probably the the most yeah is he the most famous one Probably, I, I think probably Bela Lugosi is the f most famous Dracula, don't you think? Yeah, because like just in the overall folklore of Dracula in films, people think of Bela Lugosi, yeah. you know. But like, like Christopher Lee also, just his presence is like intense too. Like he's just like this imposing sort of guy, you know. Yeah, he's like, he always, I mean, he's tall. Like yeah. it's, I... He's also like my favorite Bond villain, like yeah. in the main with the golden gun. Totally. And he's just like tall and like this lurking tall statue. And I think whatever he did after this, even as Count Dooku in, in the fucking terrible first like Star Wars installments of like the new era, he still was fucking cool because he just had like this Dracula-esque vibe to him all the time. Yeah, yeah even in Lord of the Rings too. <laughs> he was great. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, oh, man, I just, oh, this is like a rabbit hole I really fell into recently. Like, I I rewatched all these. I rewatched the show. I um, rewatched The Hobbit. And I'm listening to Dungeon Synth a lot. And now I'm getting a Lord of the Rings tattoo. <laughs> nice. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah and, and like him as Saruman, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. He's great, you know. And, uh, but, you know, other, other notables, obviously, you know, we can't, we can't do this episode without talking about Gary Oldman in uh, in Dracula yes. too, which was uh, yeah. you know kind of an iconic '90s version of Dracula. It's and, so um, '90s. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's got. I mean, Oldman was great. Um, yes, I have to say, 
I kind of feel like Winona Ryder was miscast a little bit. Yes. I mean, as much as I love right. Winona Ryder, you know, yeah. I don't see her playing in this film. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. But this, I mean, the, the whole narrative of this movie is completely off. It's like so bonkers. And uh, it's like there's lore adapted, uh, adopted and, and discarded all the time. The dialogues are almost ridiculously overloaded. Yeah. But it's just the look of it is so fantastic. It has the backstory of like the Impaler. I love this this weird red costume he has, like the bodysuit when he goes to war. And um, I love it. It's just so bombastic. It's so, so much 90s. It's so much French. This Ford Coppola. But it has my favorite Renfield in it with, with Tom Waits. And I think it has like one of my favorite vampire songs with Annie Lennox, Love Song for a Vampire on the soundtrack. Yeah. The whole score is amazing. The score is great. Uh, as much as I'm a Keanu Reeves fan, he's also a little bit miscast in this movie too as Jonathan yeah, Walker. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, I almost, I always visualize like, like it would have been great to have, a, you know, um, uh, like a different actress playing in the film as Mina, you know? Yeah. yeah. But, you know, it, she was a hot item at the moment. Same thing with, with Reeves. Gary Oldman is just like a sublime actor, you know, so he could pretty much do anything. Um, yeah. I do like the kind of uh, almost like this, like Luciferian, <clears throat> like fall from grace aspect yes. to the way that they wrote the character of Dracula too, you know, where he started yeah. out of this like, you know, very, elevated sort of guy and then went into the darkness because of you know losing mina and the the, the centuries between you know it, that that whole romantic element really ca catches me with it yep yeah and uh yeah sure like should we go through more honorable mentions by all means because related to that, like I was, I was thinking about okay, so what's my top three, and and then it's like okay, what more entries do we have? And at first, I focused on on the movies and 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 like linked to. I mean, first of all, like one honorable mention, a movie from last year I didn't hate was Last Voyage of the Demeter. Yeah. But but this is just like it's just a snippet from the book, and that's cool. And I mean, it doesn't have like Dracula as an actual like character is just the monster version of it but it's it's a cool vampire like good good like good makeup um doesn't look shitty like people gave it a lot of hate i liked it it's a good movie to watch um but yeah man uh connected to bram stoker's version of dracula and gary oldman castlevania the oh, no. the animated the, the the animated show on netflix did a really great job. I mean, I, I played these games when I was younger, and probably that's why I like dungeon synth music so much because of the old NES sounds. But um, the th I think it's three seasons, or is it four? I think it's three, and there's a new one which is like also called uh, Castlevania, but it has a different like subject. But the first three ones has like this over theatrical. Um, I actually was in love, but you brought like people broke my heart, and now I will t take revenge on them. On them, like the Vlad the Impaler kind of thing. Yeah, this the show was fantastic, man. I I loved that, and like I was, I totally forgot about that. Yeah, it's great. I I really enjoyed it. I never played the games though. Yeah, it's they're they're cool. They were like these like in the beginning on the Super Nintendo uh, was like these two day two D jump and run pretty much like but you had like the whip and you had to kill vampires and it was a great game it was fun and yeah the show was a really good adaption yeah and i have i have a third honorable mention and i think you will not have this on your list and you will say damn i forgot about that okay. but do you have like honorable mentions first like so we go yeah, back and yeah, forth yeah yeah, Gary. Gary was in. Was the Gary Oldman version was uh, was on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what, what was aside from Castlevania? What was your other one? Uh, Doctor Alexander Sweet. Does it ring a bell? Doctor Alexander Sweet. No. Mm -hmm. That's the Dracula in Penny Dreadful. Oh man. Okay. Okay. I got gotcha. you. I yeah. really love Penny Dreadful. Yeah. 
Yes, dude. And this is like thinking about this, like thinking about like what I love about uh, Dracula. And we spoke, like I said, that like no movie really nailed, uh, nailed everything in terms of the of terror and the sexuality thing and and the you know like temptation that it all bears in there. And this interplay in the last season of Penny Dreadful be, between like Christian Camargo, that's the actor, and Ev- Eva Green, which looks like a young Isabella Johnny to some point. Like she has the same, yeah. the same, you know, like the look, the intensity, the eyes. And um, yeah, when he appears, like he's uh, the director of the uh, pseudological studies, Dr. Alexander Sweet. And um, he, yeah, he's like, he knows about Vanessa Ives and he tries to tempt her and tries to own her like this Dracula kind of mania that he has. And, and then I thought about him like, oh man, this is so connected to everything we spoke about before that like between Dr. Alexander Sweet, the nice version that tempts her and the bad Dracula, it's like Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I'm a big fan of uh, Ava Green. I, I think uh, she's a great actress, and uh, Miss Ives has uh, her character, and that was was great. And um, in general, <laughs> Ava Green kind of fits the profile of like uh, women that I find attractive. In general, that is. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, you know I, I really enjoyed her in that, and um, in ge- that that was a great series, and the beginning and an end, and it and it was over. And um, they tried to do a second sort of season of that or another version of that that took place in LA yeah. it just never really clicked with me no that was terrible and I mean it flopped that's why they never did a second one of those but I think Penny Dreadful the original storyline has three seasons and it ended with uh, actually with Frankenstein you know like uh, no with Jekyll and Hyde like that Jekyll is there and you always know and then it's tempted that he will transform but then the show is just over and they never ran with it um yeah ter- I, it's like sad I would much rather see have seen them continue with that than move into the present day you know yeah, absolutely. I mean, they could have. I, I think that's the idea of like these penny dreadful comics that yeah. they, they they could have like spun off into like the the story arc of the Frankenstein monster or the storyline of Jekyll and Hyde. But um, I don't I don't know like how they choose like which ra- which ratings are like important in comparison to the costs. But they like it's one on the list like together with Hannibal or Mindhunter where you're just baffled by the success of it or Archive eighty one and they never followed up on it even though it seemed to be very popular. Yeah, definitely. So my, um, I also have a non-Dracula Dracula that I have on my list here. And, of course, I'm referring to uh, Mar- the character of Marlo in 30 Days of Night. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Totally different and unique take on the vampire. And uh, yeah. ex- excellently portrayed by Danny Houston, who also, yeah. um, you know, is uh, a fine actor, you know. And, uh, yeah, yeah he, he's, uh, he did a great job. Connecting them to something we talked about earlier, those, those vampires in 30 Days a Night, they look like they could be members of the Bad Seeds <laughs> with the way they're dressed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's like I, I didn't include this because he's not specifically named Dracula there, but he has like pretty much he plays the Dracula-esque kind of, yeah, like leader. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's like uh, hundreds of vampire movies like i mean we have 530 something movies with the dracula and i think i'm sure we can add like a thousand more that has like vampires in it yeah and so uh, i assume like at some point carl like hara will cover all 1000 <laughs> vampire <laughs> movies ever made <laughs> oh yeah definitely um shout out to the dark lord um <laughs> but um yeah man it's uh 30 days of night is such an underrated gem yeah it grew, it grew on me because I originally really loved the comic books and uh, yeah. the movie. I was like, ah, you know, it's the comics are better. But it grew on me over time for sure. Yeah, yeah. I really liked it. I mean, it has this, this 2000s horror vibe to it where, you know, like the same with like Event Horizon where you say like, eh, the CGI kind of looks a bit cheap today. But like the rest of the movie is so good that you forget about that. 
And uh, I think like the concept of 30 days of night, I mean, it's again, like I referenced in the beginning when we spoke about uh, True Detective, it has like this 30 day of night feel. It's the perfect setting for vampires. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So that's, uh, that's pretty much our take on it, man. It was a fun episode. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, stoked. Yeah. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to see how True Detective develops and uh, we'll have to regroup at the end of the whole thing and give our reflections on the whole uh, fourth season. Absolutely. I'm down for that. Yeah. And thanks uh, for listening, everyone. And we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Yeah.